And so uh, you've heard our bios. We all come from very different positionalities and does have different perspectives. We've been tasked with looking toward the future of WAC, but we can only do this through our own lenses. So we're going to explore three major concepts that we think should drive the future of WAC, but we'll each present our take on them. Coloniality, equity, and sustainability. Decolonial studies have pointed out that uh, modern day coloniality is not so much a matter of military and material colonialism of certain specific regions by foreign invaders, but a more subtle and pervasive epistemological and symbolic enterprise, a Eurocentric and US centric, rational modern, racially oriented, English dependent, center to periphery global north to global south, paradigm of knowledge making, beliefs, symbols, and ways of communication. By the way, you can see on your screen the north-south divide proposed by Willy Brandt in the 1980s and now not totally up to date. So modern day coloniality is, as Maldonado Torres put it, a coloniality of knowledge. The geopolitical location of scholars, texts, and languages impacts the politics of academic knowledge production. Interestingly, this means that Northern English-based knowledge production is located in a supposedly zero point of observation, as Castro Gomez calls it, or an unmarked locality, as noted by Lillis and Curry, which produces seemingly universal claims. This is pretty much the case within writing studies and composition. Let me quote Horner and colleagues. The field operates with a tacit assumption that scholarship is located, produced, found, and circulated in English medium, US-centric publications only. And the field implicitly circulates a certain narrative, and I'm quoting Donahue here, an American narrative of unique knowledge, expertise, and ownership of writing instruction and writing research with universal courses, sovereign philosophies and pedagogies, and agreed on language requirements. Let me share some data with you to illustrate this point. I will refer to some of the most prestigious and influential journals in writing studies, rhetoric and composition, and WAC. Written communication, for instance, claims to be an international multidisciplinary journal that publishes theory and research in writing. However, 73.2% of the authors published in the journal between 2016 and 2018 are based in central English-speaking countries, namely the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, Hong Kong, New Zealand, and Ireland. And 100% of the papers were published in English. Moreover, 90.5% of the members of the editorial board are based in the same central English-speaking countries. Not very international, to tell you the truth. As you can see, other journals also show this international scope, either implicitly or explicitly, but the profile of authors and board members is not very international. We find the same situation in across the disciplines, with 100% of authors of articles published only in English between 2016 and 2018, based in the US and Canada. And on the editorial review board, there's only one member based outside the US in a non-English speaking country, namely Sweden. Although you know that everybody speaks English everywhere in Sweden. So the future of WAC could involve considering non-English speaking literature and traditions to promote North-South research collaborations and exchanges like this one, Thanks, my pod quiz, for inviting us to engage in this dialogue. It could also actively contest historically unequal global configurations and hierarchies, identify colonial dynamics, account for gaps in local and global research, and promote real reciprocity between regions. Mainstream journals and publishing companies could effectively democratize international participation and publish in different languages, 
they could genuinely question the limitations of mainstream knowledge, especially considering their declared or implicit international universal reach. As you can see on the screen, I believe that, that the WAC Cleaning House book collections, which have consistently published the work of scholars from many places, and more recently in languages other than English, are pushing the boundaries in this regard. Okay, um, so uh, just a quick uh, dis disclaimer um, that uh, what we're charged with to talk about the future of WAC is a huge cross to bear. Um, and we, we don't have a crystal ball, um, but when the three of us discussed what we want to say, it was uh, these three terms, tropes, uh, that kept coming up. Uh, perhaps not in the predictive, but in the aspirational. So um, they're very big words and concepts, uh, and we have no delusions that we can be comprehensive with them. So um, what we're doing today is just to stimulate you about the future of work, and we hope you can share your own imaginations and visions in helping us synthesize uh, during the Q&A afterward. All right. So um, thank you, Federico. Um, on the idea of coloniality, I want to start with a land acknowledgement. I'm speaking from central Oklahoma, the traditional home of the Caddo Creek, Muscogee and Seminole nations and the Wichita tribes, as well as the traditional migration and trade routes of the Apache, Comanche, uh, Kiowa and Osage nations lands which continue to be colonized to this day. <clears throat> I'm sp also speaking uh, from the figurative lands um, of rhetoric, composition, and writing studies, which have been and continue to be colonized by the aestheticism of belles lettres, and the field of literature. I've spent the last week or so glossing over any patterns in Wackwood literatures. And uh, just as a very broad general observation, um, I'm noticing that um, corresponding with McLeod et al's uh, Wack for the New Millennium and the conception of across the disciplines in the early aughts, um, we more and more are diverging from our closest sibling fields, writing program administration and writing center work by embracing empiricism. And when we don't have numbers, I also noticed that we love using surrogate charts and graphs and tables. So I'm not sure at this point if we're creating and preserving our own culture or if we're actually um, just capitulating to the dominant colonial forces of STEM-oriented academia, with its culture of big data, uh, impact factors, and other epistemological quantifications. And I also wonder if there's some kind of Vygotskyan proximal development happening here, um, wherein we're, we're so much in service to STEM fields that we end up absorbing um, or adopting their epistemologies. So I'm, I'm thinking of coloniality in a few different ways here. Uh, first, the more literal global historical events and how one lingering consequence is that English has become a sort of de facto lingua franca of the world, um, including within exchanges of a global academics, which Federico explored uh, in more depth. And the other more figurative um, is the territoriality of academic disciplines. Um, more specifically then, I'm thinking of the ways um, colonial processes work in our institutional whack with in initiatives. I'm not the first to suggest this metaphor. Uh, I've heard it for years, um, particularly coming out of writing center um, community and work and including a few times at, at this conference uh, over the past few days. Um, if we look at, sorry, 
Elisa, can you go back uh, one, please? Thank you. Oh. If we look at uh, various institutional units, whether that's content units with academic disciplines uh, or programs or administrative units, these all can be considered imagined communities and we can conceptualize them um, using imagined geographies. I'm borrowing terms here from Benedict Anderson and Edward Said, respectively, who look specifically at the formation of nation states, sometimes naturally, sometimes forcibly around shared or imposed cultural and political values. So if we imagine various campus units that WACWID um, has to work with as these imagined communities and imagined geographies, we can start to identify clusters or continents, if you will. Um, we can then ask questions like, what are the dominant cultures in this world? Um, and each institution is its own world. Uh, what have been the sordid, socio-political and intercultural histories within and between campus communities that affect um, their inter-unit dynamics. And how can we then use these institutional histories and policies um, to our advantage? And I don't necessarily mean in a malign way. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of power and relational mapping uh, uh, to inform our WAC outreach, advocacy, and decision-making. So I'm gonna leave the metaphor there for now, but we'll pick it up um, again throughout the other two keywords. Yeah, so as you can see, as we're demonstrating for you, we're not really presenting this talk as a coherent whole, but in staccato, in chorus, a lot of our ideas align, some of them divide, um, others perhaps even contradict, uh, this is on purpose. We want to draw out the tensions uh, between how all of us approach these ideas of coloniality, equity, and sustainability uh, very differently uh, based on our own positionalities so that we're collectively creating a polyphonic whack of the future. So on coloniality then, Al's ideas of imagined geographies has really got me thinking about WAC as a connector. Um, I believe this image of a bridge is AWAC's proposed logos or one of their proposed logos, both to note the connecting work that AWAC does as an organization, uh, but also the connecting work that WAC does in general. We connect faculty across the disciplines to one another. We connect disciplinary writing to research and principles in writing studies. We connect writing happening inside the academy to writing happening beyond the academy. This connective work I think is possible because of the connections we even make within our field, right? Constantly refreshing and brainstorming the connections between theory and practice, research and administration, principles and pedagogy. I further see WAC as this generative hub across many uh, cross sections within writing studies, right? writing assessment, transfer, genre studies, lifespan writing, media studies, problem-based learning. So much WAC work draws on and benefits from these various areas. Uh, but then WAC also provides the space to put these areas into conversation. So David Russell, no relation by the way, just a lot of admiration, especially flowing from me to him, uh, even recently described technical and professional writing and first year of writing as two inextricably linked poles of transfer research with WACWID in the middle. So the middle, the connective tissue, interstitial. My question then is how does at WAC act as a conduit, a generative middle space without subsuming or claiming everything as our own? But then on the flip side, how does WAC maintain its visibility and identity amongst all of these connections so that we can keep making them? So I am going into my second year as faculty, hired to lead WAC initiatives, not a WAC director because we don't have a WAC program yet, that doesn't exist. Um, and I'm facing a lot 
lot of those just really classic issues for someone starting up a WAC program, right? I want buy-in from a variety of stakeholders across campus. I'm trying to learn the various uh, campus initiatives and offices I can partner with and hook our mission into. I'm working with top-down mandates while trying to cultivate a bottoms-up approach. Okay, so many people have written on all of these things. A lot of people in this Zoom room have read a lot of it, and it's all so good. But these questions I'm asking about WAC as a connector and what that means in terms of coloniality are palpable, even in these very kind of old hat basic WAC operations level. So one thought toward the future of WAC is wrestling with this question of what does it really mean to invite ourselves physically or metaphorically into others' disciplinary classrooms, into other fields? Uh, what are we inviting in turn? In other words, how do we steep our work as connectors in collaboration and reciprocity? Is it possible to offer all we can and receive all we can, to use our position as connector to constantly recreate our identities as a field, as program, as scholars? Thank you, Elisa. Um, so our second driving concept is equity. But uh, before I get into that, uh, I want to start by sharing with you all that it has been mentally and emotionally draining to be at conferences like IWAC in organizations like AWAC and adjacent ones like in Writing Center and um, WPA communities, wherein I cons consistently find myself in spaces and moments where I'm one of only a very few non-white people, sometimes the lone single one among 20, 50, or in today's case, um, upward of 100 people. At a physical conference, I can at least sit toward the front uh, where I don't have to see um, behind me the rest of the room. But uh, in, a, in, a, in a virtual conference, I, I, I'm, I have to see the whole uh, Zoom room where everyone is always visible uh, and that's even more exhausting. Um, so I want us to get on the same page about the term equity, which is not the same as equality. I know some of you already know this, so uh, just uh, bear with me if you do. Uh, in case you don't, in this often shared visual, there are many variations out there, but in this one, we can see a baseball game representing any kind of event. Uh, there are three people who want to participate and who have a different number of boxes, or you might say tools with which uh, to do so. Equality is giving each uh, the participation tools in, in such a manner that lets everyone part, uh, sorry. Uh, equality is giving each, each of these folks the same number of tools, whereas equity is distributing these participation tools in such a manner that lets everyone um, participate in the same way. So the visual does end with yet another term wherein the fence or the systemic obstacle, whatever that may be, is dismantled. Um, and we might call that liberation as in the visual um, we might also say justice, social justice, institutional justice, or as Federico has reminded me, emancipation. <clears throat> so how does this play out in WACWID work? On Wednesday, um, Pamela Flash and Teresa Red's mid-conference plenary um, showed through the illuminating live poll that they did during the plenary that 78% of us who, who attended and participated feel that the most urgent question or work of WAC scholar practitioners is, how can we best implement anti-racist policies and practices? So I'm making the assumption that knowing how to advocate for um, students' right to their own language, specific calls for WAC to be aware of linguistic difference, anti-racist writing assessment, and uh, for linguistic justice are all administrative and pedagogical concerns that are pressing in our work today. 
the big question is, how do we do that? Uh, there's only so much I can say in this limited time. So what I want to focus on is actually for us to take a step back. Um, one of the most common grievances I hear from WAC colleagues is that other academic units, um, and they're often business and STEM, uh, but also just generally colleagues um, who don't train in language and writing, are bootstrapping standard language colonizers who refuse to acknowledge other Englishes in student writing, including but not limited to Black and other vernacular Englishes, various international student Englishes, and other US regional or working class Englishes. People just get really frustrated at this. Um, but if you have this grievance, a big question I have for you is, who is doing this advocacy work? If this is what your WACWID programs, writing programs, writing centers, other stakeholders look like, how effective is your message going to be? Over the course of Breonna, the Breonna Taylor George Floyd culmination of summer 2020, we saw a lot of anti racism popular books enter our collective consciousness. Um, one of the authors, uh, psychologist Beverly Daniel Tatum, who wrote Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Can We Talk About Race? claims through studies that children learn exclusionary racism through the example of their parents. Ironically, the white parents she studied tell their children to integrate in schools, you know, play with all the other kids, but they themselves only socialize with white friends. So it's a form of the old adage, do as I say, not as I do. And to me, this highlights the very human disconnect between our ideals and our actions, which as smart and kind as we are, academics are not immune to. So here's a very simple heuristic I've developed, very, very simple, um, to help you decide whether or not you are ready to do linguistic equity work with um, colleagues across campus. Does my blank look sound and read like blank. And you can insert any of the appropriate variables depending on what the work is. For example, does my program, WACWID, writing, whatever, look sound and read like the student population I am advocating so hard for? Does my WACWID research project or initiative look sound and read like my country or region? Um, and if you claim to be an international level institution, conference, organization, or journal, does it sound, does it look, sound, and read like the world? If the answer is no, I think we need to step back. And I mean that not just for whatever individual programs or initiatives we have going on, but also for WAC itself. I invite you to look around the room um, do we really think we're ready to go out there and advocate for anti-racism, students' right to their own language, anti-racist assessment, and linguistic justice? So to take it back to, if I'm big, bad, linguistically ignorant business or STEM colleague, and the agents of change you send out to me are always white native English speakers looking, sounding, and reading like standard English. And you tell me to value linguistic difference, but your actions show otherwise. Why should I believe a single word you have to say? Maybe we should work on equity at home first so that we can develop the ethos and integrity to go out there and do that advocacy work when we're ready. And so this might be an odd time to do this, but um, it's the most appropriate for me. Uh, and I'd like to thank Mike Palmquist and the conference committee for making 
uh, for convening the three of us and making this space today. Yeah. <laughs> so when it comes to equity, as so, Al, as Al so clearly helped us understand as distributing participation tools in such a manner that lets everyone participate in the same way, I keep returning to this question. Where are the access points into WAC? And I mean that on the level of where are the access points for upcoming WAC scholars, like graduate students, where are the access points for scholars in different disciplines, like uh, those in adjacent or even non-adjacent fields who are doing this work right outside of writing study for faculty at our own institutions, for students at our institutions? Where are the thresholds, the crossover points, the paths in? Are they visible? Are they intentional? Are they equitable? Maybe that one will come up thinking about it. I'm starting to hate the term organic. Um, you know, we say we want things to happen organically or develop organically. And I do understand that sentiment, especially, and sometimes that is the right approach, especially when it's in opposition to like strong arming or taking over or moving too fast. But I think a lot of times things happening organically just means things happening under a cover of occlusion. Uh, things happening for those people who are already in the know. In other words, I think it hides access points. Uh, many are afraid that if we make things more formal, we lose a lot of flexibility. And I just don't think flexibility has to be the cost of formality. We can still be uh, flexible while making the ways in visible. So as one example, uh, the WAC Graduate Organization runs a cross-institutional mentoring program, which pairs uh, more established scholar practitioners in WAC with graduate students or early career faculty at different institutions across an academic year. And I've seen so many people um, this week who have been part of that program. It was great to, to see you. Um, before we started this program, and even now when we do the intake survey each year, we see over and over graduate students saying that they don't have WAC mentors at their institution or they don't know how to find them. We also hear established scholar practitioners saying that they want to learn from a new generation of WAC scholars and work with them, but they don't know where to find them. Uh, the formal program makes these connections possible. The mentoring relationships still grow and breathe and take different shapes organically, right? But the formal program creates a clear point of access. You know, I had amazing mentors uh, <laughs> in grad school, WAC mentors, um, and that's why I'm here today, but it's because I got super lucky and I got shoulder tapped. Um, that's not intentional, it's not equitable. But even beyond providing clear access points to promote equity, we then have to value it through reciprocity. So in the mentoring program, this means mentors learn just as much from their mentees as the other way around. Uh, and I'm actually going to quote at length from uh, a study that we just did of the mentoring program from one of our mentors and end this section with that because it doesn't really need further explanation. She said, you know, my mentee is a person of color and we've talked regularly about race and racism in academia in general and in our field. This has got me thinking about the importance of direct support of graduate students from minoritized groups, not just for those individuals, but for the field. If we truly want the diversity of our scholarly community to reflect the diversity of our communities and our schools, as I believe most of us really do, I think we need more of the kind of direct, sustained, personal mentoring the Cross Institutional Mentoring Project is creating. This work does not show up in publication records or in major named initiatives, but I believe it makes a difference one scholar at a time that will change our field as much as the big picture work of big name scholars will. Thanks, Alisa and I'll, I have been doing research on non-traditional students in Chilean universities. Until recently, enrollment in the university system in Chile was quite small and only for a privileged minority. I am sharing with you some pictures of my students. They were not supposed to be there. Their university was not supposed to be there either. But their 
there they are and their university exists because students in Chile are probably the most active agents of change in society. They do not lack agency. Those are the students speaking. On the contrary, the protests that you can see on the left helped create a massive program of free tuition and the first new public universities in around 80 years. I am proud to work for one of those universities. The image on the right, on the other hand, has led to the drafting of a new constitution, which is an ongoing process right now in Chile. Something important to consider is that so-called non-traditional students are traditional students now. They are the largest group of students in Chilean universities. In fact, very often, their universities, faculty, and pedagogy of writing seem at odds with current realities in higher education, as all pointed out earlier. So what are the lessons learned from our research in Chile? Historically excluded students repeat and embody dominant deficit discourses, especially in the most competitive programs. But these negative self-perceptions contrast with their agency and resilience. They engage in complex but stigmatized or hidden vernacular practices and often resist receive dominant literacy practices. They deploy self-sponsored strategies which help them build bridges between their authorial identities and higher education tasks and requirements. And what are the pedagogical strategies we are putting forward? Recognize, validate, and make room for the vernacular practices students engage in. Design tasks that call for creativity and agency, that is, which involve research, perspectives, decisions, and engagement. Refer to meaningful, situated, and controversial topics related to social struggles or family and community histories, for example. Report critically and write parodies of received literacy practices inviting recognition, but also resistance, negotiation, and transformation. Promote mixed genres and code meshing in the same text to train creative and sophisticated writers who can use their complex semiotic resources and talk and reflect on their choices. These are just a few research-based pedagogical insights, and you may well be more familiar with them than I am, but in any case, I think that the future of WAC could involve further exploring what an inclusive, anti-racist, socially just pedagogy of writing could be like. We know more about diversity and equity than how an equity-based pedagogy should look like. What you are seeing now is a picture in a literacy history written by a student of mine, Sophia, about her grandmother who dropped out of school in third grade when her father found out that she was able to write. Enough schooling, her father said. And my student, the first in her family to attend higher education, heard this story during her research for this assignment when she interviewed her 87-year-old grandmother. So the future of WAC could involve exploring students' incomes, as Guerra puts it, through genres such as the liter literacy narrative, as recently advocated by Linquist and Halbritter, it could also involve exploring anti-racist assessment practices, such as labor-based grading contracts developed by Inoue, not just to include or validate students' household and community practices, but to truly transform our teaching practices that seem to be a bit old-fashioned for what today's world demands. All this so that in such a way, we can help to promote social emancipation. And so our last driving concept in looking towards the future of WAC is sustainability. This term has been invoked a lot throughout the week, uh, starting as one of Chris Tyson Carol Rutz's, you know, main concepts in the opening plenary, and then as one of the major questions that came out of Pamela Flash and Teresa Red's fantastic survey in mid-plenary. Uh, it's a concept, uh, I, I think we all have a felt sense of health, right? Uh, it describes something about lasting power, manageable growth, continuing across contextual and generational changes. But of course, how to actually invest in and build towards sustainability gets really complicated. 
So Michelle Cox, Jeff Galen, and Dan Melzer's book, uh, I should say now, award-winning book, uh, they draw on no less than complexity theory, systems theory, social network theory, resilience theory, and sustainable development theory to propose their whole systems approach for launching and developing WAC programs. I say that to say there are a lot of factors that feed into sustainability from sustaining the field as a whole, all the way down to sustaining the individual WAC initiatives at your institutions. I want to then just draw out one healthy tension that I think we'll have to wrestle with going forward when it comes to sustainability. And that's the tension between visibility and disappearance. So Cox, Galen and Melzer describe visibility as the perception of a WAC program across its networks and projects, emphasizing that WAC tends towards stagnation and institutional entropy if program visibility is not a priority. At the programmatic level, this includes things like sponsored events, university-wide assessment, data sharing, program review, faculty support, student and faculty recognition, curriculum grants, and department by department planning. And gosh, we've seen so many sessions uh, on these things this week that have been so good. Uh, at the level of the field, these uh, moves toward visibility can be seen in, you know, longstanding the WAC Clearinghouse, our WAC journals, the IWAC conference, uh, the formation of AWAC, and shameless plug, the WAC Summer Institute, which is a fall institute this year in October in Albuquerque. Uh, registration opens August 15th. Yeah, I'm going to drop the link again probably during the Q&A. Um, we see so many of the points we've mentioned throughout this talk come to bear in how AWAC founders describe their purpose in establishing a formal, i.e. visible, organization. So they write, a formal organization can, one, my Google Slides are, are thinking about it today, provide codified structures for active membership in the WAC community, two, ensure equitable pathways for scholarly and professional development in WAC, Three, establish procedures for cultivating new uh, leadership. Four, envision and build new resources for the WAC community. And five, include faculty from WAC programs who would not likely have become involved without institutional membership opportunities. These, this is what I was talking about earlier about formality, right? That, that it leads to all of these things and the visibility is part of what makes this possible. So this is crucial for sustainability, uh, but a word on disappearance. Uh, so Rita Malinchek has a great piece called Wax Disappearing Act, uh, published almost 10 years ago now. She describes WAC as being gradually subsumed or dispersed into other disciplines or programmatic structures, and therefore being transformed into something other than what it was before something perhaps less obviously about writing alone. She doesn't see this as a failure though. Uh, she sees it as a success, even a fulfillment of WAC, that faculty would embrace the movement so that it became simply part of the scene with writing something they taught in each class and something they could write and publish about. She thus sees the disappearance of WAC as an opportunity for transformation. You know, we can create all the programs and professional organizations in the world, and I'm for that the visibility, for the formality, the division of labor, the collaboration, the equitable pathways. But these organization, organizations have to be recreated constantly uh, because sometimes the fulfillment of goals is actually disappearance. Or maybe that disappearance is telling us that our original goals or structures are no longer responding to current needs. You know, Chris Tice talked so well about this in the opening plenary in terms of adaptability. Uh, so for sustainability, uh, there has to be constant reflection, constant renewal, constant recreation. Uh, and this can be done through like assessment, but uh, I think what I'm envisioning is more than that. It's regularly inviting a lot of different voices to revisit and question even our most fundamental structures in our campus initiatives, in our programs, and our profession. Is this still working? How have the stakes changed? And then what's been done? You know, uh, 
what's been fulfilled? What's what goals have been reached where they can blend in and disappear to make room for what needs to happen now? In other words, when we look towards the future of WAC, um, I'm thinking that maybe visibility and disappearance aren't at complete odds, that for sustainability, we need the ability to do both, to carve out visibility when we need to and to disappear when we need to, or at least to let pieces disappear. This is what gives us the ability to transform and shift our efforts of visibility so that we're meeting a constantly changing landscape. Thanks, uh, Alisa. I will refer now to a very specific aspect of WAC sustainability, research. Research that we can use tactically, as Adler Kastner would put it, to convince stakeholders to fight for funding to influence educational policies, to reach an academic position, or to engage in international conversations like those I mentioned before. You can see on your skin two WAC awarded books related to research. But we face a challenge. Many of those stakeholders, policymakers, employers, and international colleagues do not care too much about our books and book chapters, but expect and even demand that we also publish our research in index journals, especially those indexed in databases such as Web of Science or Scopus. So in a way, what sustainability depends on the existence of such index journals where we can publish and distribute our research. But the truth is, there are not many such journals. If you compare them to other related fields, such as sociolinguistics, second language teaching, or higher, higher education studies, you may say that there are good reasons for this configuration. You may say that index journals respond to a different epistemology, to a different knowledge-making culture, and also to a different rhetoric of knowledge-making. From this point of view, Index journals belong to a positive, positivist epistemology, to quantitative approaches, and to a relative lack of theoretical depth, which may be common in other areas such as STEM, as uh, I'll explain before. Moreover, Scopus or Web of Science are for profit, neglect languages other than English, and measure scientific relevance in very controversial ways. So they are quite colonial, if you think about it. However, indexation does not mean indexation in a particular way. It just means that a certain journal complies with certain quality and integrity standards, which is an indication of good research. But the criteria for indexation may vary. So our fight should be about certain criteria for indexation instead of against indexation. Let me refer to an example, Cielo, which means uh, sky in Spanish. Cielo stands for Scientific Electronic Library Online. And in short, it is a cooperative, not-for-profit, multilingual, open access, South-based bibliographic database. It was created in Brazil in 1997 and now includes 17 countries many of them from Latin America, together with South Africa, Spain, and Portugal. It lists currently over 870,000 records. It is free to publish and download any record, and your journal needs to be open access to be indexed. But it is not just a repository of open access papers published in the Southern Hemisphere and written in many languages. It is quite difficult to get indexed in Cielo, as you have to comply with standards that are common to many other databases, such as double-blind peer review or periodicity. The meaningful contribution of Cielo is just the opposite. Good, socially responsible science has to comply with quality standards and needs to be open access and not for profit. This scientific perspective may resonate with WAC scholars and practitioners, as it is quite similar to many WAC initiatives, such as the Clearinghouse Journals, Alisa, Alisa mentioned before. So my point is that the future of WAC could involve paving the way for index journals, 
which can engage in conversations with stakeholders that demand research articles to sustain our educational claims programs and policies, but at the same time, to fight for certain alternative criteria for indexation, which promote free access and democratization of knowledge, together, of course, with multiple languages, approaches, and epistemologies. Thank you, Alisa and Federico. I, I want to dovetail um, from what they're talking about in terms of sustainability. Alisa's reference to the Cox, Gale, and Meltzer work on sustainable WAC and um, Federico's deconstruction of the research and publication processes, both of which are very comprehensive in, in looking at institutional structures and systems. Um, we're also good, very good, at making the subject of our work, uh, the students we teach and the content colleagues we reach out to. But we really think and talk about ourselves. Um, and I'm not sure why, uh, and if that's maybe part of the stemification or empiricization of writing studies, this hesitance to, to acknowledge the subjective. So I'm thinking about the agentic human um, behind these processes, directors, uh, coordinators, um, with teachers, instructors, etc. And I'm asking the question, what is our role? Um, I'm, I'm again borrowing from writing center discourse, uh, specifically Elizabeth Cowan's many hats metaphor for uh, that writing center directors and tutors wear. Um, contextually, depending uh, on with whom they are interacting. And also from Shirley Rose and Erwin Weiser's works on um, the roles of administrators as researcher and the follow-up as theorist, um, all to pose that WACWID agents too need to be limber in the roles that we inhabit. So to build and maintain more sustainable relationships, I think one, we need to maintain a high level of self-awareness uh, of ourselves, and hence the question, what is our role? And two, if, as I mentioned earlier, um, the many groups and units we interact with on campus all hold different uh, cultures and maintain different values on education and language. One role may be as anthropologists to better understand these differences. But once we do understand those differences, what then? Um, are we missionaries? Um, if so, what kind? The kind that goes around campus and knocks on all colleagues doors at 8 a.m. Uh, in the morning to spread the gospels of Baker Bell and Inouye and, and Kennard? Um, are we politicians? If so, what kind? Are we colonizers and invaders? Um, should we be aggressive in liberating students um, who are writing in other fields? Um, you know, are we doing a kind of operation STEM freedom? Um, or do we subtly uh, spread out cultural values like Hollywood does, which itself is a form of neo-colonization? And uh, I'm thinking of how WACWID is at the borders of writing studies. So are we then border patrol agents? And who, you know, who keep migrants from entering our field? Um, and, and if they do enter, what ways are we deporting them, caging them up or giving them water and nourishment so that they help rejuvenate um, our field intellectually? I also heard um, in a Wednesday session on cross-disciplinary collaboration, Maureen Matheson distinguishing what practitioners as tourists versus sojourner uh, the latter of which is, is more thoughtful in, in their movement and travels. So the, the point I want to make here is that, um, to extend the metaphor, to build and maintain sustainable WAC relationships on campus, just like any cross-cultural or multilateral international relationships, 
there isn't one template approach of um, what role we inhabit, but that we need to be more mindful, deliberate, and chirotic of the roles that we do embody and move between. Whew, okay, so um, ultimately, um, we don't have an in, in conclusion uh, for you here. Uh, at this point, we don't want you to feel a sense of finality for how these ideas factor into our whack futures. Uh, instead, we want all of us, the field, the journals, the organizations, all the scholar teacher practitioners uh, to forge ahead Explore and, and explore all these questions and the ideas we've presented uh, to see where it takes you. We're not looking to close things, but to open. Yeah, so in that spirit, I'm actually going to, in a minute, I am going to drop a link to this Google Doc. Um, we want to turn all of these thoughts, <laughs> we've, we've just kind of dropped a lot of things on you. Um, and I feel like this whole week has been a lot of generating questions, especially coming out of that mid plenary, right? Those were your questions you generated in the survey that, uh, Pamela and Teresa so, so thoughtfully, you know, coded and, and put together. And so we want, uh, to crowdsource and turn this, we do want to take your questions. We were unsure how chatty people would be at this point uh, of the conference if you're feeling the little dip, you know, your, your drinks and your naps are calling you. Um, so we do wanna go into a Q and A, absolutely. If you have questions, comments, we wanna hear from you, but we really wanna turn your attention to this collective action plan. And we've even included the, the mid plenary questions um, from Wednesday. What are the answers to these questions? What does it look like to put these into action? And so this is an editable document. We've started uh, based on, uh, you know, our talk and the things that we've been thinking about. We've started adding some items. I encourage you to add items and then add comments, either on your own item to further explain it um, or to ask questions, right? Like I wrote this one, but I'm wanting examples, right? And for this to be a space where we really start for thinking towards the future, what does it actually look like? Because we want to have a cacophonous kind of future, not a, a monolithic one. We want something born of our collective experience. I'm going to stop my share and drop this in the chat. <laughs> So we look forward to hearing and, re and reading your questions and ideas. Thank you very much.